Hello everyone. Today in our series of Doc Flix's KOL interviews, we have with us Professor Dr. Shiv Patham Vittal, who is a renowned endocrine surgeon and popularly known as the father of endocrine surgery in India. He is currently associated with Apollo Hospitals Chennai. He is the recipient of prestigious Pradam Shri Award and Dr. B. C. Roy National Award for his role in creating the specialty of endocrine surgery at Madras Medical College, the first such department in India. He was also awarded the Teachers Teacher Award for his dedicated teaching work in the medical community for more than 40 years and has published a book on surgical endocrinology. Thank you Professor Vittal for this interview. So can you please tell us about the progress and development of endocrine surgery in India? Well in the year 1980, um, in a smaller way at the Madras Medical College, we have started an uh, offshoot of the general surgery concentrating on endocrine glands and uh, slowly we have developed uh, into a separate specialty. In the year 1986-87, after I had been appointed as the professor of endocrine surgery at Madras Medical College, this has taken a good shape. After that, the I prompted people and uh, the next came Sanjay Gandhi Institute of Postgraduate Medical Sciences at Lucknow and very recently at the Christian Medical College at Vellore and now so many institutions are following the development of endocrine surgery in India. I think after that the, the structured training in India started. The first such structured training was at the Sanjay Gandhi Institute of Postgraduate Medical Education at Lucknow and second the Madras Medical College also has started MCH course. Now we have a the Christian Medical College also. I think in the due course, I expect that uh, many more institutions will produce MCH, a structured course to conduct the MCH exams. Can you elaborate on the indications for surgical interventions in thyroid for thyroid disorders? Well, the, there are so many in India particularly the indications for surgery on thyroid, uh, mostly on nodular goiter, multinodular goiter is rampant in India. And it could be a nodular goiter, could be a multinodular goiter or a solitary nodule. And the next comes the neoplastic uh, goiters in the form of malignancies of thyroid and so on. And to some extent, today we see many more cases of thyroiditis is also being operated. So slowly the indication for thyroid surgery is going on increasing. So can you tell us about the current changes in thyroid surgery? Yeah, I think uh, about a couple of decades ago when we started, most of the cases when there is a solitary nodule, we used to do hemithyroidectomy. Half of the thyroid has been removed and later on the patient may come for uh, recurrence on the other lobe and uh, today we all understand whatever has produced on in this lobe can also operate on the other lobe also after all said and done thyroid is one organ so today we nearly do what we call a to total thyroidectomy and to some extent near total thyroidectomy when you are worried about the recurrent lernial nerve and uh, Many people uh, started doing total thyroidectomy even for benign condition because it is important that uh, we should not miss a lesion on the other lobe. So how do we manage a patient after they have had a surgery for thyroid carcinoma and are there any developments that has been done in this arena recently? Yeah, the, the management of uh, patients with thyroid carcinoma just now I said is total thyroidectomy is the answer. There is nothing short of total thyroidectomy. But a day was there when they used to do hemithyroidectomy with low risk, high risk and thin. Today we believe that it is better to do a total thyroidectomy in the Indian scenario. And uh, when you do a total thyroidectomy, after that when the results come, when it is confirmed it is a malignancy, there are broadly, I always think, there is a differentiated thyroid carcinoma 
wherein the papillary carcinoma and the follicular carcinoma are there where what we do is we give after three weeks we give we we don't uh, give them any thyroid supplementation and uh, we give them a radioactive iodine ablation for whatever remains over the that uh, thyroidectomy there may be small remnants may be there so in order to take care of that and micrometastasis may be there we want to take out so we give a radioactive iodine ablation whereas in the case of medullary carcinoma of thyroid we do not have any such things uh, and uh, the next thing that you have uh, the, is there any change yes there are changes i just told you the we give 3 uh, weeks or 4 weeks after surgery to give the radioactive iodine ablation the reason is you want the thyroid stimulating hormone levels to go up that will stimulate the dormant secondaries so much so when we give the radioactive iodine it will take up and get destroyed that is our aim and that is why we give a period of 3 to 4 weeks today what is happening is if you are going to do a total thyroidectomy and tell the patient not to take 3 uh, to 4 weeks of uh, thyroid not to take they feel little uncomfortable with our thyroid they feel that they have got constipation they have got lethargy they have got lots of problem and likely we have now we have as uh, uh, we have that uh, genetically engineered uh, we have that uh, thyrogen or artificially produced tsh is available as injection though it's little costly we give one injection or two injections and then immediately we give radioactive iodine ablation thereby the patients are avoided an unnecessary waiting of 4 weeks today so only thing we are about giving the the, the synthesized tsh is that you have to pay a very heavy price but it avoids the waiting period of 4 weeks after total thyroidectomy so what are the developments that have taken place in the diagnosis or management of primary hyperthyroidism in the last few decades or last two decades to be specific yeah previously primary hyperparathyroidism previously once we diagnose it's only a biochemical diagnosis and once we diagnose it we used to explore and uh, we don't go about localizing those days we only say localize the parathyroid a good parathyroid surgeon and once you localize the good parathyroid he may be able to localize where, which of the four parathyroid is fault but today we have so many things uh, uh, as developed so we can identify which parathyroid is at fault and uh, what we do is today is we completely investigate these people and try to localize and then only go ahead with the surgery there are groups of people they still don't localize at the initial stage once the biochemically proved hyperparathyroid by that i mean a high level of pth uh, pth along with high level of uh, calcium both are calcium so if there is there they are, and of course corroborated with other smaller things they have got what is called biochemical hyperparathyroid they want to explore but today we have very good system like uh, ultrasonogram and we have system ab scan has come in very handy today wherein we can easily locate which gland is at fault so we can go and do straight on to the parathyroid which is at fault so can you elaborate on the investigative modalities that you used uh, that help you to uh, localize the abnormal parathyroid in interoperatively Yeah, that's the uh, in whatever sense then the parathyroid surgery is an enigma. I call it as because either it can be very easy, you go there, you get it and remove it and come, or it can be very difficult also. So it so happens many times. What has happened? You go about and you remove that, but there may be one more. What is called abnormal parathyroid, ectopic parathyroid, a supernumerary parathyroid. So in in a case like that, if you have or you operate it but the patient still has a hypercalcemia what is called persistent hyper hyperparathyroid or you operate 6 months later they come back or one year later they come back and that is called as recurrent hyperparathyroidism in these cases what we do is after opening we about 2 uh, uh, hours prior we give system ab and tagged on to radioactive iodine 
and with the handle giga counter we find out where is the para abnormal parathyroid and we are able to do it and to know certain that we have removed the abnormal parathyroid today we have a rapid intraoperative parathyroid estimation we estimate the parathyroid before surgery hormone and after removal the biochemist tells me we send the blood and they tell the, the level as if the 50% is the because the parathyroid is got a very short half life uh, about a couple of minutes or so so uh, you take that uh, parathyroid out and send the blood and if they say 50% drop in the pth level you know very well you have succeeded so with these two tools namely uh, intraoperative parathyroid estimation and uh, as i told you sesame b scan with a giga counter you can be little more comfortable today so can you please comment on the status of islet cell transplantation in diabetes mellitus yeah i am <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question because i strongly believe that the wonderful world of beta cells i always say the, that is the, for every minute minute the blood sugar changes the beta cells is able to deliver that amount of insulin that is required to keep the blood sugar normal so what is happening is uh, if you whatever method we give uh, by insulin delivery system we may not be able to match the uh, i islet cell production so people have started thinking why not we give islet cell transplantation and uh, islet cell transplantation has become very difficult because we don't get that amount of islet cell which is uh, which can control the sugar level to normal and uh, so much so we have got tissue culture etc etc and all world over the uh, experiments are going on how to culture the islet cell and then to, and then we inject the islet cell into the portal vein with the help of a uh, interventional radiologists and ultrasonologists and so it helps uh, the one of the problems is the rejection as in many another per transplant the rejection is a big problem and uh, today i do not know uh, it's not going to be very useful but a day may come uh, if it succeeds if somebody is able to get it uh, organized it will be a good solace for type 1 diabetes mellitus who is solely dependent on the insulin so thank you for sharing your views on islet cell transplantation can you also tell us about uh, the surgery of adrenal how it has changed uh, nowadays yeah the, the surgery of adrenal i still remember when we are all uh, coming up the, it's a big issue because surgery of adrenal means lots of uh, today it's uh, slowly become the diagnosis has become very easy because uh, for instance pheochromocytoma we have uh, if the person has got a hypertension and we estimate the plasma metanephrine or urinary metanephrine and we know very well it is there and we have got specific uh, radio immunological technique like meta immuno meta iodobenzyl gonadine mibg scan that will take up the chroma fin tissue i know very well the pheochroma adrenal is there not only that extra adrenal tumors also are picked up by the mibg scan and same thing with the cholesterol also we have uh, iodo cholesterol scan so this sort of localizing techniques i made it easy the adrenal surgery previously we all the cases we used to open up a rooftop incision and uh, we see both the adrenal because the adrenal tumors can be bilateral but after the advent of the imaging technology we know very well it is uh, once we are helped by this uh, immunological techniques by the radio immunological techniques or imaging technology we can go and remove it target it and remove it and that's what's happened with the advent of mini or in minimally invasive uh, technique today laparoscopically we can easily go and remove the adrenal comfortably today as, as far as i am concerned the laparoscopic adrenalectomy has become the mainstay or gold standard for adrenal surgery not only laparoscopy we are also getting into another area where we go through the back 
that is through the retroperitoneum. Retroperitoneum, you can go without even going into the peritoneal cavity. You can go behind and remove the adrenal. But that does not hold good for a big adrenal tumor because you may not be able to remove a big adrenal tumor. So, they have to be taken by open method. We always set a standard. We decide preoperatively. If the thing is more than 10 centimeter, we do not try to do it by minimally invasive technique. So, you have been associated with several international institutions like the Royal College. So, what is your opinion about the future of endocrine surgery, especially in Indian context? Well, I think uh, because we have started endocrine surgery and we have started uh, uh, identifying lots of uh, diseases. For instance, the disharmonogenetic goiter, we have identified more a number of cases in India and uh, particularly the iodine deficiency goiter is uh, we have uh, sort of uh, identified in the northeastern sector and uh, these things have to be uh, reduced or they have to be iodized salt to be given to these people in order they do not get uh, iodine deficiency they are goiter and uh, today I think with the development of so many technology which is available in India most of the things we can tackle and I want people to take it up the islet cell research so much so I think uh, a day may come the type 1 diabetes mellitus people may uh, why type 2 diabetes who would also require may benefit by islet cell almost all the organs except brain and something like that are being transplanted and I I don't know why still not we are able to I hope a day may come in India somebody may take it up islet cell that's my right. So, we hope the same. Sir, Dr. Vittal, what is your opinion about an online platform like Docplexus? Can it help in knowledge sharing among doctors? Certainly, I tell you. That is what I think because it is very difficult because today is a day where a very hurried day. So, many specialities has come. So, many new technologies. Before I leave this, somebody else has started another techni technique, technology and things like that. If somebody online, if I am able to get the message very quickly, I think why not? I think uh, this is a wonderful idea. To my mind, I am quite uh, happy that uh, such thing is going. I wish that it takes up a little more because everybody can uh, online to try to know what is happening quickly from the experts and immediately they can try to do it. I, am, I think it is a wonderful idea. Thank you so much sir Thank for your you. kind words and it was a privilege to have you on the platform. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks. much. Sir. To stay updated on our latest scale videos and interviews, please follow us on Twitter, like us on our Facebook page and subscribe on our YouTube channel. Happy Dogplexing!